Yeah, so again, just to welcome everyone to Lotus Roundtables. I'm really happy to be um, introducing Ezra Farouk. And um, I, I'm just because I'm so interested in his topic, um, I'm going to just read the description very briefly. So the technological advancements in aviation of the 20th century were accompanied by ideological clashes and geopolitical revolutions that shaped the world as it is today in the process of meticulously reconstructing a MiG-21 interceptor from everyday materials, high-speed flight uh, becomes subject, object, and concept. And that's, this is, that's a very uh, cursory introduction into what as if is going to be kind of presenting this evening for the first couple of minutes, and then we're going to, of course, break into the open format conversation, which will be moderated. But um, as if is really just going to be kind of dropping some knowledge on us for a few minutes, and, and here we go. Well, thank you very much, man. It's I my pleasure. It. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, guys. That's a fruit. I'm, uh, I was asked to come here. Uh, by uh, Amanda here at Locust and, uh, and Rob going on is Rob has written a book about the project and, um, and, and we'll get into what, what that means and what that is but, but uh, they asked me to come in which is it's an honor and thank you so much everybody for coming um, we have uh, uh, different members of the production team here tonight uh, Erica Mohan if you could raise your hand there she is and uh, that's my production superintendent and uh, Nick Sindrick that's, that's my agent back there, and uh, Tish, yeah. the outreach coordinator, and uh, AK String, that's my uh, fashion department. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, so we have a, a team, and I'm, I guess tonight I'm sort of spokesperson for that, but one of the, the, the ideas that I wanted to talk about tonight was, was high-speed flight. Um, it's a subject that's, that's sort of an odd subject in, in art, well, maybe it's not even a subject in art, typically, you know. Um, but it's something for me that I've always found very, very beautiful, right? And, um, and one of the other things that I think I'd like to, to sort of keep in mind while we're discussing this is, is the idea of verisimilitude. When I, was, when I was very young, I wanted to draw representationally very well, like with a high degree of accuracy, you know? Like, that's what I thought being an artist was. And... Um, uh, I, I guess I still think that's what being an artist is a lot. And uh, so I, I made an airplane. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what led to that and what I find so beautiful about it, right? And why, why I would want to maybe recreate something like that. Uh, so that's uh, Leonid Brezhnev. He was a silver premier. And uh, I, I really like that picture of him. Sort of imagine that he's a. Uh, that he's uh, calling. So, I'm not like the best at PowerPoints, but I did my best, and this is where we're going to start. I, I, I put together a PowerPoint for for this. And Thank you. I, there we go. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Is that on? Yes. All right. So this is the uh, uh, this is the phase three journal of of my my uh, my production. And that's what it says. It says that in Cyrillic and Russian. It says Phase Three Journal. And um, I thought I'd start here. Uh, I'll tell you what I what I think is is really beautiful. So this is a guy named Ernst Mach, and it's it's what the the uh, the 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 Mach speed indication is named after. He was a Austrian physicist and. Uh, uh, a shockwave engineer in the 19th century. And although uh, I don't know too much about shockwaves and shockwave dispersal and those sorts of things, I am very interested in physics. And uh, he had a, a profound impact on uh, not just physics, science, and math, which would be about what you'd expect from, from a guy like that. Um, he's the 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 guy that we, we get the idea of, of a Mach speed, right? For those of, the, of you that aren't aware of what that means, um, there's different types of, of flight regimes, right? And um, uh, what that means is that you have like subsonic flight, for instance, right? And you have high altitude flight, and you have supersonic flight. Supersonic meaning faster than the speed of sound, right? 
And uh, when, when, you're, when you're nearing the speed of sound, which is nominally about 730 feet per second at sea level, right? Uh, you're in the, the transonic flight regime of flight envelope if you're a flying object. Um, once you pass that, right, you start to, to record your, your flight speeds with a system of, of mocks, right? That's M-A-C-H. And, um, uh, and then you're supersonic, right? Meaning that your object, whatever it happens to be, is moving faster than the speed of sound. I promise that the boring part of this is only going to last like 10 minutes. <laughs> but the, um, and uh, so here's a guy. And, and w w one of the interesting things that Ernst Mach did in his lifetime is he, he sort of codified a philosophy of science, right? Um, which has had a, 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 a far-ranging sort of impact on, on physics and science, and not only just uh, the, the sort of mechanical aspects of it, right, like the equation side of it, but also how people look at, at the scientific method and how they approach problem solving, which has impacted, whether you're interested in flight or not, it has impacted your life in some way or the other, right? Um, and uh, so what I wanted to do is, and, and I, I promise it gets less boring as we go on. <laughs> Um, so these are, these are some guys, like, and so for me, right, when people ask me, because I work as an artist, like people ask me all the time, like, well, what artists do you like? And, and I'll tell them, well, I like Dr. Alexander Lipich, that's the guy over there to the left. And um, there, there he is holding a, a, a Delta Wing prototype for his aircraft, the uh, FD-1, which is um, flying Delta-1, right, basically. And um, uh, he flew that for the first time in the 1930s which is, is sort of remarkable. The idea of a delta wing is, if you, if you, you guys have all sat in an airplane, has everyone here been on an airplane? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and you notice that the wings are sort of long, right, and they kind of sweep back a little bit, that's the wing sweep angle, which sort of covers some of these subjects um, uh, as we go along, and, and it's, it's not too terribly important uh, to, to the, 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 the material of the discussion, but it, it, I really enjoy telling you guys this stuff, so bear with me. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the delta wings are optimized for high speed flight and man maneuverability, right? So if you want to do like acrobatic tricks or something, for instance, or, um, or you want to shoot down another airplane, right? You might want to incorporate something that has those characteristics. Um, and he's, he's incredibly important in the history of delta wing flight. Uh, he was the first one to fly a, a Delta winged aircraft, which was the FD-1, I believe, in 1939. In the middle is a guy named uh, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. He was the son of a, uh, a guy named Jeffrey de Havilland, and uh, they had an aircraft manufacturing concern in England. Uh, Jeffrey de Havilland, his father, was a pioneer of flight and built a lot of the, the planes that flew in World War II in, uh, during the war. Uh, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr., in fact, himself was the first person to fly a de Havilland Mosquito, which I think is sort of analogous to my airplane because it was all made out of plywood. <laughs> Mine is made out of paper, but it, it, it utilized sort of the shortage in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in available metals for the war effort in a novel way, and it's, it's a particularly pretty aircraft. And then all the way to the right is a guy named Chuck Yeager. And I, I don't know if any of you guys know who he is, but he was the first person on August 14th, 1947, to break the sound barrier. And so the sound barrier was so named, and we're going to go back to Jeffrey D. Hamlin Jr. for a second, he died trying to break the sound barrier. And the sound, sound barrier was, was named the sound barrier because it was sort of a theoretical, like, uh, aeronautical brick wall in the sky. Once your airplane got too close to the sound barrier, it would hit it and disintegrate. And that's how Jeff Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. died. He died in uh, September of 1946, uh, flying the uh, DH-108. It was a, a, a high-speed research test aircraft. And, uh, which I was always kind of like saddened by that, you know, like reading about Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. Um, because, like, here's a guy, you know, with a lot of money and, all, you know, sort of the, the keys to the kingdom, you know, and, and he would, he would strap himself into this really dangerous sort of machine and, and for, for, the, uh, for the benefit of science, you know? So I, I think that's art, I think that's beautiful and I think that that's art. Um, 
And then Chuck Yeager, right? So Chuck Yeager, there's an interesting story about Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier. He broke the sound barrier uh, in August of 1947, and um, I believe August 14th. And he, uh, he was horseback riding with his wife two nights before out by uh, Muroc Dry Lake out west. And um, he fell off the horse and broke some ribs. So, like, when you're, when you're a pilot, whether it's a commercial or military pilot, you can't just fly with, like, broken bones and missing limbs and everything else. You have to be of, of sound body. And so he went to a veterinarian that night, right? He went to a veterinarian and he got his ribs taped up because he was going to do the, the, the record-breaking flight, perhaps. Uh, no one had done it before. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Bell resident test pilot, uh, Slick Goodland, I believe, refused to do it unless he was paid something uh, like a million dollars in, in inflated today dollars. It was Chuck Yeager, the, the United States Air Force, sent him in to do it, and he broke his ribs riding horses around. And uh, he went in there with his taped up ribs, and he got his crew chief, a guy to, to, uh, to cut off the end of a broom handle so that he was able to close the door because he didn't have mobility with his right arm. And, uh, and so they went up in the air, and they, they, uh, they dropped from a, a B-52 research aircraft, uh, very famously the, uh, the tail number 008. Uh, research aircraft. And uh, I just want to interrupt you for one second. Can everyone hear as if speaking yeah. by himself? Okay. 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 And, uh, and so when you go to the mall in Washington, D.C. at the National Air and Space Museum, you see the Bell X-1, which is that one right there, the orange one. Um, it's, it's got that, that piece of a broom handle still, still in the cockpit, sitting there in the museum. And, uh, and we're going to go back for a second. So Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. He was also the first man to exceed uh, Mach 2.4. Uh, briefly, Scott Crossfield held the record for Mach 2. So now we're talking about 1,400 miles an hour, right? Or approximately one mile every two-thirds of a second. Right? That's really, really, really fast. It's, it's faster than, than sound travels and, and obviously a lot of other things. Okay, so now I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I started welding in, in 1993, and I worked as a, as a metal fabricator. I'm a welder. I weld. <laughs> and uh, in the late 90s, it started making neon signs, and then uh, about 2002... I started making analog synthesizers and function generators, and I've worked as an art teacher on and off, and I've worked in construction on and off my life. Uh, obviously, I've also washed a lot of dishes. <laughs> and um, when, you, when you decide that art's going to be a career, you sort of are, are limited in, in, in sorts of income. But these are some of the things I've done, and, and that's some of, of my background, and, and to the subject of the talk. So I, uh, I, uh, I wanted to talk about the Cold War and how that sort of generated like an impetus to, to create exotic aircraft. Uh, what I think of when I think of aircraft, I think of, of the very best aspects of, of, of human thinking and, and practical application. I don't see like flying death machines. I see, I see gleaming metal cylinders with, with, uh, with purpose designed airfoils that some engineer at a, at a drafting table somewhere made. And to give you an, a, an idea of why that, that would be uh, something that's of beauty to me, my father was a civil engineer. And growing up, he always had a drafting table and he'd be making lines on things. And I didn't really understand what he did, but I thought it was beautiful and fascinating. And, and uh, now I kind of get to do a little bit of that myself. So this guy here is Joseph Stalin. He, uh, he took over after, after uh, Lenin died. And he was a dictator, and he sort of forced a lot of the Soviet aviation designers to work under the gun, quite literally. You know, they would be separated from their families and their children, and they would design these, these beautiful aircraft uh, in gulags, in the, in the system of gulags that existed in the Soviet Union. And uh, if they didn't turn in results, quite often they would, there was like a very severe punishment. Right, it wasn't just like you got you weren't really getting paid anyways, but you could you could uh, you could lose your life. 
So the, the aircraft that, that were designed in, in the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and, and I'm, I'm giving you my version of the narrative. I, I understand that there's a variety of different ways of looking at a very broad and very expansive area of history, right? Like, there's a, there's a whole school of American apologists that are like, Stalin wasn't so bad. You know, that's not my opinion. I think he's probably pretty horrible um, in a lot of respects. Maybe not all, but in, in maybe many. Um, but I guess as far as I'm concerned, you know, my interest in him has to do with, with, uh, with, with Soviet aviation for the most part. Uh, and so here we are. And, and this is, by the way, what I think of as being the fun part. So. <laughs> Um, this is, this is uh, 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 Dr. Alexander Lipich's conceptual drawing that came out of his, his, uh, his uh, factory or whatever. And uh, after the war, this is the Bell X-1 that Chuck Yeager flew to uh, break the sound barrier. And over here, and here and here, you have three Convair aircraft. Convair is a portmanteau of the two parent companies, which was uh, Consolidated Volti and... Um, another smaller company that they acquired. And uh, it was an American aircraft concern that no longer exists. And this is their, their prototype, right? And you can see it's sort of sh stubby, and, and it doesn't really look like it should fly very well. And in fact, it doesn't. It's a Convair XF-92. And then this right here is, is the F-102. And if you'll notice that they all have like these sort of sharply tapered delta wings, and they don't have a, a, a horizontal stabilizer, right? These are the different parts of an aircraft, right? Um, the F-102, uh, former President George W. Bush flew for the Ohio or the Texas National Guard, supposedly. <laughs> and <laughs> um, this is an interesting aircraft to me because in, in America, part of, of the way that we express technology historically has been to, to throw every, every sort of gadget and all the bells and whistles at it. The F-102 was interesting because it had, uh, for an American aircraft of any kind, it was the first one to have a fly-by-wire control system. It was an electromechanical fly-by-wire control system. Uh, most modern aircraft have a digital uh, analog of that. And um, uh, it had a lot of kind of neat features. One of them was it had like a 1950s version of Siri. They had a reel-to-reel -reel <laughs> recorder in the cockpit with a woman's voice that would, that would give the, the presumably male pilots important information. And they had done studies on this where uh, the, the test subjects responded more favorably to a woman's voice. And so her name was Sexy Sally, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is, this is I like this picture. It's not very clear and we're projecting it and it came from a small internet image, but it's a B-58 Hustler. And uh, for, for the next minute and a half or so, it's gonna take you hostage. Um, it's one of my favorite aircraft. I think it's, it's really, really beautiful. It sat three people, and when they, they tested the pilot egress system, they tested it on live bears. It was a clamshell-type ejection system that ejected downward. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a Mach 2 plus supersonic nuclear-capable uh, intercontinental bomber. And that's, that's sort of the heart of this talk. Right. Um, in the 1950s, with the advent of, of intercontinental jet bombers that were capable of delivering a nuclear device, uh, and there was a, a, a short window period thereafter where, where the Soviet Union rushed to design what uh, is termed a point defense interceptor. And a point defense interceptor, the Soviet mentality was not to build you know, a few thousand F-102s with a lot of gadgets, they would build 20 or 30,000 really cheap jets and field them all along the, the geopolitical border of the, the former Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact allies. And, um, uh, and it, was, it was to combat jets like the B-58, right? Uh, from, from an aesthetic or a, a form follows function point of view, you know, you notice that, that all these things which are optimized for high speed flight have these delta wings. And this is important in just a second. Okay. That's their MiG-21. 
And uh, this is the F-13 model. It has delta wings, but it has a tailed appendage. Unlike the, the American F-102 with the, the mechanical uh, fly-by-wire flight control system, this, they couldn't st solve a lot of stability problems that they had with their, uh, with their German scientists. It's important to note also Dr. Alexander Lipic uh, wound up in America. There's a, a very famous uh, uh, American and joint British operation called Operation Paperclip where we took a lot of these Nazis and we brought them to this country and we forced them to work for us and design weapons of death and destruction. Uh, Werner von Braun is a very famous example of that. He, uh, he, he designed the rockets that, that uh, went to the moon for this country. He was a, he was a high ranking member of the SS. When you go to uh, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and you look at all his medals there, you know, it's, it's uh, at least to me, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's funny, because he's got all these, you know, national medal, freedom, and everything else. He's got 25 medals there, if he's got any at all. And, uh, and, and all of his, his commendations that you can Google him, you know, there's, there's pictures of Adolf Hitler actually pinning medals to his chest. And they're not there at the, at the museum in Huntsville, Alabama, which is, I think, it's sad, you know, those were his medals. Um, but, but there's a kind of revisionist history at work here, you know, in, 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 uh, in the way that, that we approach uh, defining ourselves and our role in, in, on the world stage. So growing up, I, I like to make paper airplanes, and I, I often would fantasize about you know the good guys and the bad guys, and, and good guys were white and bad guys were black, and that sort of thing. You know, it's very easy sort of mentality for a, a five or a six year old to adopt. And um, I often wondered what what was happening in the Soviet Union. This is still in the 1980s, and I remember feeling like as a kid, like I I didn't do anything to them. Why do they hate me so much? Um, it's because I'm a capitalist. So this is another picture of a MiG-21. This is a later model. This is a MiG-21 BIS. Uh, it, that's the internal Soviet nomenclature for improved. And uh, so this is a nice picture. And this is my MiG-21. So I made a MiG-21 too. And uh, it's, it's kind of a compressed image, but uh, I guess you can kind of see right here. This is the the intake, and it's a little bit. And this, right? So, so my working on this project is is me mining my childhood. You know, kind of like re-exploring ideas that that I thought I had a, a a reason to to believe growing up, and. Um, and wanting to make paper airplanes, you know, like being a kid is awesome because you don't really have to be held accountable for the way that you think necessarily. You know, you have a lot of time to, to you don't know it. You know, everything feels so acute all the time. But um, or I, I felt like I felt things acutely, uh, and kind of growing up and thinking about my life and, and my my life decisions, you know, existentially and everything. I thought it was a, a kind of good metaphor for how I felt about myself and, and just my role in life, you know. Um, so I started to, to think about, like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I made a paper airplane? And, you know, during the, uh, the Soviet Union, there was, a, there was a dearth of information available about the specific components of, of aircraft, their capabilities, and so on. Uh, typically, the West would find out about what they were doing from defectors or, or spies or something like that. But there wasn't too much information that, that ended up getting published or being available. Um, this is the Sapphire RP-21 uh, scanning uh, radar array. It's based on a cavity waveguide magnetron, which is interesting because you all probably own one. A cavity waveguide magnetron is the same type of vacuum tube that you find inside of your microwave oven. Uh, this is the dielectric cover for it, and, and uh, this is the thermionic unit in the sink. And this is it mounted in the forward fuselage of my aircraft. So, talking about my work now. And then this is the, uh, the shock cone, right, uh, that's mounted onto the front of the radar. The shock cone, more properly, is termed a biconical air inlet center body. And what it does is it has two uh, very specific slopes that, that hit the air, presumably at supersonic speeds. And, and it creates shock waves, just like when you drop a rock or a penny or something into a pool. 
and uh, and that slows down the air uh, for the turbine, for the low pressure compressor. And this, these are um, well, okay. So this is the back of the ejection seat. It's a, a KM1M00 ejection seat, and this is the uh, the front of it. And um, and the stripes, I'm sorry, are just a, a it's just the projector. It's so just sorry the about projector. That. It might be coming through here or something. That's okay. So. Part of uh, fabricating, by the way, all of this is made out of paper. And um, uh, part of the challenge for me was, was figuring out how to make multiple compound curves out of paper and, and uh, find a system of organization that would make that possible. This is the R11. It's, it's, uh, so what I've managed to do, right, is, is I backwards engineered the MiG-21. Uh, I decided to, to build it part by part, both internally and externally. And um, also, the airplane is my airplane. It's my MiG-21. I'm, I'm too tall to have fit inside of a MiG-21, so what I did is I scaled it up slightly so I would fit into it. So it's actually larger than one-to-one than -one scale. It's one to uh, uh, 1.083. Right, and so like this, this is what, what I find to be really beautiful, you know, like I don't have a laser pointer. I, I imagined all week I'd have a laser pointer and it sort of magically would appear and that didn't happen. So, <laughs> this is the... They wouldn't have a laser pointer anyway. <laughs> yeah. This here is the, uh, the low pressure compressor. This is the annular combustion chamber. Uh, this is the airflow separator and this is the chuck. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> you know, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Of course. Yeah, this is cool. So, like RoboCop. So, so this is... So, so, right, so... so you're too close. It works if you're far away. Um, yeah. We'll get a laser pointer for next round table. So right, and um, and uh, and what I wanted to do, you know, like I, I think these things are so beautiful. I grew up, like I said, thinking that engineering was beautiful. And um, my favorite artists for most of my life, after after I got to be about seventeen or so, were 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 typically like people, you know, practical scientists, guys that made stuff. You know, all through the nineteenth century, you had a lot of Thomas Edison's and Nikola Tesla's and things. And, um, then, then by the 20th century, you know, you got a lot of guys with slide rules and, and, and number two pencils, and these are the guys that sort of designed the, the world that we live in, and I think that that's really cool. Because, like, art's not just, you know, I think of art as being, like, three or four different things. You know, there's art that you make that you show other people that, that you say is art, and that's it, and then there's art that you don't make at all, and that you show other people, and then you call it art, and that's it, and, um... There's art that's art, but that nobody calls art. And, um, uh, and I like to think of, of art, some art, as art that you make for yourself. You know? and so I, I kind of made this for myself. I didn't really expect to be showing people. I knew eventually that that would sort of happen, but um, I, I really did just make this for myself. This is the uh, low pressure compressor spool. And one of the things that I have to do to make, uh, this is the, that's that. That's that. And that's the low pressure compressor spool. In order to, to give all the blades a 45 degree longitudinal twist, I made my own tooling and jigs. And that, that sort of is across the board for the entire aircraft. I make my own cutting bits and, and uh, a variety of different uh, mechanical systems that sort of allow for that. And so every once in a while, Erica, my production superintendent, is here, and she'll tell you, like, we just make it, and then afterwards I make drawings. I shouldn't tell you that. Um, but it's all about verisimilitude, and it's okay with me, you know, like, um, it's the appearance of truth. You know, this isn't an airplane, it's, it's a big, expensive pile of paper. But, <laughs> but, but like, it kind of looks like an airplane, and this looks like an engineering drawing. And that's, for me, that's kind of like the fun of it, you know. Uh, so all the switches and different components and everything else work. Um, and what I do in order to make them work is I, I create little mechanical systems within, within the airframe that, that allow for that. And so this is a switch panel, and this is what it looks like when, 
when it's put together. And so all these switches slip up and down. These are uh, electrical system indicators and so on. And this, is, this is my favorite. You can't really see it. Maybe this will help. <laughs> so that's the GSH-6 right there. That's the high altitude pressure helmet. And like, like a little kid, you know, I want to I wear a helmet and I want to have a little oxygen hose running around and eventually I'm going to sit in my airplane and, you know, pretend to shoot down those planes. Um, and uh, that's a, this is interesting, you know. So we've solved a lot of engineering problems at the shop. Um, and that's a flexible piece of, of paper tubing, right? Little things like that. Um, this is a, a hydraulic assembly uh, for the aircraft. And these are individual components of the nose wheel brake. Uh, so there's the, the nose wheel, and these are parts of the universal joint system that allows it to articulate the shock uh, absorbers, oleos, and struts. And then these are the brake pads that are a little bit like the ones in the car. So here you can see again the. Um, this is partially assembled uh, nose wheel strut and then the universe joint system that allows the, uh, the main wheels to remain uh, oriented 90 degrees uh, during retraction and extraction. I, I, what I do sometimes just to, to mess with people is what I'll do is I'll laminate paper, right? That's paper over there. And then I'll sand it at an angle so it looks like wood. And then people like to fight with me about, no, that's made of wood. And I'm like, no, it's not. But I did it on purpose to sit to fight. Uh, um, this is the, uh, the control column for the aircraft. And a lot of times I sit with this at my desk at work and, uh, and I pretend to shoot down F4s over North Vietnam. I think we have a quick question. Yes, yes it does. Okay. And so this is a mock-up of the cockpit. As it, uh, um, uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> two or three weeks ago, and um, it's it's just a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. This is another example of this. This one's really cool because it's me eating a baby. <laughs> and, all right, I don't know if I can get this to work. Hold on, um, Amanda, do you know how to how to do this? Like. Will this work? Is it a video? Yeah, this is a video. I, don't, I just don't know how, how to get it to work. Does anybody know how to do this? <coughs> Looks like it's just been playing indefinitely for... Oh, start over. Press the start over button. The, the little refresh circle. Oh, yeah. oh, there we go. All right, guys. This is the nose wheel retraction. Uh, for the airframe. Um, there it is. I can do that again. That's good. See? Maybe not. It just doesn't seem to want to work. All right, so, so this is the, the tail end of me talking. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to tell you guys, um, uh, can I tell you guys a boring story? Is that all right? <laughs> right, okay, so in, in 1962, a Russian guy named uh, Pyotr Ukimich wrote a, a, a paper called Edgeways in the Physical Theory of Diffraction. And it's a very, very interesting, but very dense, and even by, by physics papers guys kind of standards, boring paper. And uh, it just basically talks about radio waves bouncing off of flat planes, and like he goes on for 200 pages about it, and it's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, of uh, equations and things like that. And so nobody read it, and um, except for one guy named Dem Dennis Overholzer, and he worked at at uh, Lockheed Advanced Development Projects in Stunk uh, in in uh, Southern California. And uh, after Clarence Johnson left Lockheed, a guy named Ben Rich took over. And he had worked on a lot of the, the Lockheed advanced sort of development projects. Projects. He was, in fact, Kelly Johnson's like number, number two guy. And 
he started working on, on a low radar cross section or, or stealth aircraft. And uh, Kelly Johnson, who was sort of a, a really important and very powerful figure in aviation at the time, was like, you know, it's a stupid idea, and he called it the hopeless diamond, and he, he assaulted Ben Rich over it. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, by the late 70s, they had a, a working prototype demonstrator. And when they talk about stealth and low radar cross-section, I think this is really remarkable. Um, he, they used the, the edge waves paper in order to do this, which sort of elucidated the way to, to doing this uh, in the first place. And uh, in uh, 1978 or so, this is the Have Blue prototype demonstrator. And to give you an idea of what shows up on a radar screen when you're looking at something like this, it's about the size of a quarter inch diameter ball bearing which is real small. Now, interestingly, this shape and configuration, you could make it as big as you wanted to, and it would still have just a quarter inch ball bearing sized uh, radar cross section. So the design is scalable because unlike every other aircraft we've talked about today, um, it wasn't designed from an uh, aeronautical engineering perspective, it was designed from an electrical engineering perspective, and that's really significant in aviation. And I, I bring this up because for me in my practice, you know, like, I used to, I think, I, I flew under the radar most of my life. I worked as a welder and I did very utilitarian things for people and um, uh, neon signs and things like that. And um, now now I fly right through the radar. I'm a stealth human. And um, and that's, that's the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> Can the radars pick up this little one? They are the ridge radars. Uh, what's the smallest object they can catch? What's the question? Sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, they can. They can. Well, sophisticated radars. You know, the radars are, are one of those things where size does matter, and so it, the Soviet Union and, and um, uh, North American. Airspace defense both had huge systems of radars located all over the Arctic Circle, all over in Canada, here in, in the Western Hemisphere, and, and then all over the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. I have one more, I'll say. Okay. How did they solve this uh, sound barrier situation? With the cone? They, they did brute force. With the Bell X 1, it was brute force. They just pushed through it with rocket engines. It wasn't an air breathing jet engine, right? It was like a rocket can be just like the kind of. of of uh, uh, rockets that you get during the 4th of July. Just a solid rocket motor rocket, although for the Bell X-1 they were liquid fueled. But, you know the white rockets on the side of the space shuttle? Mm. Those are solid fuel, just like a firework. Testing. Oh, Mark. Yeah. Were you saying that that was the first proof of concept? I thought that. No, the, the Havlu prototype demonstrator was the proof of concept for um, the F 111. But earlier, Lockheed designs like the D 21 drone that, that fit on top of the, uh, the, uh, the different um, the D 21 drone mothership, SR 71. The SR 71 had uh, a primitive form of low radar cross section. It also had uh, uh, radar absorbent paint, and they were already working with it, but the the uh, the idea of making a, a flat plane object that was you couldn't fly the half blue prototype demonstrated and then subsequently the F one seventeen without very sophisticated uh, 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 digital fly by wire systems. What was that word? Fly by wire systems. <laughs> so clearly, a lot of you know information, but kind of something I wanted to. I had to just questions as well and we can continue the conversation and one of them is the title of, of what you wanted to to call this talk tonight which I'm going to butcher it but Balalaika. Balalaika. And what, what is that? Can I, can I just show them? Yeah, we can, can I just show them? Fired up. <laughs> Thank you Daniel. It might take a second. And in the meantime while that's coming up um, you brought up the interesting idea of um, hinging kind of what you're talking about on verisimilitude which of course verisimilitude is uh, something looking sort of real enough 
it doesn't have to be real, but it it has the um, it has the appearance of reality. Or the appearance of truth. The appearance of truth, and I mean, the interesting thing about that is is that um, I mean, there's no there's no I mean, in a very concrete sense, there's no mistaking what you're building for a real. Oh, there's him again. Um, <laughs> there's no mistaking what what it is that you're doing for a real airplane, but but you're taking going to these painstaking lengths to create this verisimilitude, and perhaps verisimilitude is a is a larger idea that you're just conceptually interested in, or that it can be discussed here. Well, it's appealing to me because based on my, my work education history, like this is as close I'm, as I'm getting to an airplane like this. And and so this is, I made it so I could have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back to balalaika. Uh, a balalaika is a, 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 a string lute-like instrument, uh, a Slavic string lute-like instrument, and it has a triangular plan form. So if you look at it, right, like a guitar has that sort of Coke bottle shape, if you look at a balalaika, it's, it's like a triangle, like two delta wings. And so Soviet pilots, uh, all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when they flew the MiG-21, they, uh, they, it was an affectionate nickname for the aircraft because it also has you know, like two triangular wings. Okay. Which I think is a really pretty name for it. Hey. Yeah. Uh, super weird. Super weird. Uh, I have no hint to see what this report is. Why did you think of maiden? Uh, instead of an F-16. Right. Um, how do you feel about space travel um, having reached the conclusion it's reached because that used to be part of the spectrum. Right. Especially back then with these, these pilots. And then three drones. And they, how do you feel about drones? Um, um, okay. This one I picked because uh, to my eyes, it's really pretty. I know it's an awful answer, but it was it was a close race between the Su-7 and and the MiG-21. Um, I picked the Cold War jet because there, I just I always had there was an exotic otherness to to things that that sort of fell behind the Iron Curtain, you know, growing up. And I I've always kind of you know you always kind of want what you can't have, you know, like F-16s are everywhere. I, I was I was interested in twenty one because I felt like well in order to engineer this thing so I don't have blueprints right um, and uh, and there's no publicly available plans for it I just sort of gave up on that but um uh, like it was it was a challenge in a lot of respects you know it's still oh uh, by the way the MiG twenty one first flew in uh, in nineteen fifty six the Ye five prototype. Uh, proof of concept for what became the MiG-21 first flew in, in 1956. And uh, and so next year will be its 60th anniversary and next year is when, when my plane will be completed, which is kind of a fun thing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's still being fielded by 28 countries of the world. It's still being manufactured in three of them. Uh, it, it's sort of like, you know, it's been used in more wars than any other, so it's a particularly appropriate airframe. Whereas the F-16 doesn't have so much combat history, or, uh, or, or in in my eyes, or my my sort of researching of the thing, you know, it's not as as uh, it hasn't been as useful. They made thirty, I think the, the current count is somewhere around thirty-five thousand MiG twenty ones. And to give you an example, back to the the. Uh, the uh, Western Contemporary, which would have been that F-102 we talked about earlier, uh, they made just a few thousand of those, right? So the Soviets believed in, in building tens of thousands of a thing, and in fact it was easier and, and cheaper and more inexpensive to, to replace a MiG-21 than to repair it quite often. So I like that mentality of sort of mass producing things and making something, that's a really good question because it's, it's so commonplace, right? Like every war that you've seen on TV has a MiG-21 in it. Okay. Right, but it's not something that most people, I think, would take a second look at. And um, I think it's sort of my job as an artist sometimes to, to communicate that that idea. Right, like that's what I think of as my job. Right, is to communicate. And and the ideas that I pick to communicate are, are things obviously that are you know special to me. So. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the 
Uh, drones? Um, I'm not going to answer that. It's a big subject. And then the... <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a long, big subject, having to do a lot with the history of aviation. And they've been around forever, by the way. You know, like, drones have been around forever. Since there's been airplanes, there's been drones. In fact, drones predated airplanes because you have paper airplanes and things that, that people would make, and that's, that's a flying object. It's a, that's an airplane. Sinissa. Thank you for all this. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Beauty. Beauty, right, yeah. You know, and often I find that that is kind of a, a taboo within the market. Sure. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's that super special kind of shit that sits on the surface. It's flat one, you know, nobody wants to touch it. And, you know, and I'm really happy that we've used it. Oh, so man, you stuff. know, I, I love so using that one. project that you're building, which is, I think, this kind of personal journey, which I applaud you uh, for sharing with us. Um, I can't wait for the unveiling, to be honest, but to see it in person. You know. should come by soon, so. But um, one thing that I do want to ask you uh, is I'd like to see if you can kind of maybe talk a little bit more about, um, you went through a lot of the kind of the, the ideas of the technology, but what I really like to hear a little bit about is uh, the, uh, the ideology behind, uh, I guess, the Cold War and how it still possibly functions and maybe even exists still today. Um, and also, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if this is in uh, the, this, this idea of Well, it's actually just a fantastic series of questions, Nessa. I, I, these things are so. The MiG twenty one, as it was originally conceived, was a point defense interceptor, and it would go up and intercept, inter you know, uh, uh, supersonic or subsonic NATO jet bombers. And it existed for a very brief sort of window in time. The the idea of it, right? Um, because uh, soon after there were. Uh, practical intercontinental ballistic missiles that could deliver a, a thermonuclear warhead. And so within a period of about four years. And so it immediately became obsolete. It, it became repurposed for, for many generations thereafter for a variety of other tasks. It got used as a fighter and a attack bomber and so on, uh, where it's probably done most of its work, you know, and, and just as a pure interceptor. But uh, it's the same thing with mine. It's impermanent. You know, like, it, it would have been easier in a lot of ways, especially from an engineering standpoint, to make this out of metal, right? Like, I have a lot of experience with metal, and I wanted to make something that would be hard, if not impossible, to take care of, you know? Like, it's possible, and I'm designing it to, to be a legitimate, you know, load-bearing structure and everything. But um, the, the idea that these things were, were worked on so feverishly and, and with, like, the greatest urgency... Uh, only to be discarded a year or two later is, is a, a really great idea for me. You know, like I, I sort of latch on to things like that. So exactly what you said is is what uh, is sort of the framework of it. You know, I, I did I worked as a metal fabricator for a long time, and I made very permanent things, really great awnings, by the way. <laughs> and um, a lot of them have survived several hurricanes, and I drive by and I see them, and I think like, wow, I did a good job on that on it. It's still there, you know, like five hurricanes later. And, and um, growing up, you know, liking art and uh, being interested in the subject, you know, you're exposed to a lot of things that have a, a great deal of sort of like archival things going on with them, you know, they're, they're maintaining them. When you go to the museums and you look at these aircraft, they do the same things with those. They're not living, breathing things anymore. They're sort of being taken care of in a static position where, where uh, they've been sort of, you know, deemed to be inoperable or whatever. Um, uh, I wanted to make something that would have, have a real life no matter what, you know. 
and uh, and something that was very impermanent. I didn't. I, there's there's a difference between the big and the monumental, right? Like this is this is a dream that I had where I wanted to make something, and um, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if I made this airplane? And, and um, but it's like the same. The, I I sort of equate that idea to like the idea that like I'd love to eat pizza for dinner tonight. It's this, it has the same value for me. And when I went back to the idea and I decided to sort of go into it, I, uh, I, I, I just wanted to honor the good idea, you know. And it was, it was big and it's been somewhat difficult, but it's you know at least for me it's been worthwhile. But yeah, there's there's it has to do with impermanence, you know. I'm always thinking about that things coming and going, things being born and dying, and and I think that that the idea of military aviation sort of really encompasses that thought. You're welcome. Well, I just want to say first that you beautifully come from such a childlike place, even though you're, you know, not everybody so thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, that's the essence of creation and, and art, I believe, in myself, anyway. Um, the next question is you said you would make things sometimes and then you would do some sketches. How important was the actual blueprint? Opposed to the kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, what's the word? Or, um, My cat. Okay. No, like improv, improvisation. There's very little improvisation. Um, there's technical problems a lot, you know. So I'm working on a lot of little things in front of me and doing those things. Uh, typically, uh, as Erica will testify, uh, I have a very good eye, and so I'm able to to to, uh, and Jeffrey will be able to testify to that as well. The, um, I, have a, I have a pretty good eye. Um, uh, when I do measure after the fact, which is what I do, um, uh, in some cases I'm within 0 0.083 inches within in, inside of 17 feet. So there's, there's a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty accurate tolerances on what I'm trying to do. And, um, uh, you know, it, because paper is such a, a, a difficult material to engineer, but it's a really easy material to fix. So there's that. Does that answer that? Yeah. So we kind of just got a strong compositional intuition. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I made that stuff for years. You know, I always built things. And it's important that you get it right the first time. That's just efficient business. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <coughs> I remember, you know, when we first had this conversation about about this, and you were you were telling me about all these technical aspects of how to create the plan, and, and, then, I, and then I was also like, well, what, why is this interesting to you? You know, what what is it that? Um, and, and then we and then we really talked a lot about actually the history of the Soviet, um, you know, period of history, and and how aviation and the developments in aviation um, were ideological and shaped, shaped the world that we live in today. And I found that so interesting, and I, I wonder if you can help, you know. Well, yeah, okay, so, like, there's, there's a variety of different narratives, right, you know, about um, what really happened in, in uh, the middle and the end of the 20th century. Um, and, and I think from, you know, like, a... a a documentary or like a historical perspective, you know, people talk a lot about what 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 happened in politics. You know, right now we're we're in the middle of an election year, right? I don't own a TV, so I might be wrong about that. But there's there's uh, I, I hear people talking about political candidates a lot, and I think that there's an election coming. And one of the things that I'm sort of always what that's, that's totally legitimate. So the um, one of the things that I'm always sort of, I guess, aware for myself is this idea that, like, we have very strong opinions about political candidates and things. But I, I try to tell myself that as, as, as strong an opinion as I might have, I'm not really exposed to the same information that they are. So I don't, I can sort of judge after the fact. And then there's always the idea that they're not telling you everything they know. And so how do you really know what's going on? You know, but as far as the Cold War goes, um, I, I just always found it very fascinating um, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, because of, of, of 
like ethnic migrations, you know, my, my, my parents were immigrants and uh, uh, growing up kind of like getting the party line here in America, you know, and, and hearing what, what America stood for and, and, and getting a very kind of undiluted message about it. I mean, it always sort of made me question if that was all that there was to know, you know, and so I, I, I did, I still do study it a lot, like I read about it, that's what I do for fun. It's not very fun probably for you guys, but it is for me. Um, and uh, I like to, to hear what, like I just like to just process information about it. I guess that's the best answer I can give you. Like I like to read as much as I can about it. Because the more that I know, the more that I feel like I have like a, a multifaceted or, or holistic approach to, to the idea because there's so many personalities involved. Like should Truman have dropped the bomb? Right? It's a really important question, right? You know, was Oppenheimer such a bad guy? Was he a good guy? Was he, was he unfairly crucified? Um, uh, was Lavrenti Beria a, a, a serial killer? You know, the guy that succeeded Stalin. You know, these are, these are the pieces of information that were given, and just little snippets of it. And, um, and they're all very, like, tantalizing and, and sort of, you know, uh, they can even even be sort of scandalous, you know. And and when you sort of delve into the personal histories of the different people who, who were involved, I like reading biographies. So I'm not even so much concerned with the idea of like the tent, right? Or or uh, what the economic significance of Nixon's visit to China was. And did he only do that because he wanted to distract from Watergate, anyways, right? Like, is there, you know? Um, and then of course, this guy. This guy here, I think this, this just sort of died. I just needed this computer to work long enough to, to do the PowerPoint. I'm, I'm totally cool. But the, the, the half-naked man uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, a guy named Leonid Brezhnev. And so he immediately wanted Nixon to visit right after Nixon visited China in 1971. Uh, because he, he didn't want, uh, and it was entirely a political move, he didn't want the... Uh, Chinese at the time, and um, he didn't want the Chinese at the time to get too close to to the Americans. And uh, so I, I got him back on. So if you want to flick it on, but I just I just really love this picture of Bre uh, Brezhnev. Um, and Brezhnev was an interesting guy too. He had a hobby, a really bizarre hobby. He liked to get really really drunk and get foreign limousines and crash them on the streets of Moscow. And um, and there's some fun in there. And, uh, and, and, and kind of trying to figure out what my role as a citizen of the planet is in all of this. Because I think that the, the last 50 years of, 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 of world history has been remarkably important in understanding where we are now, right? And also, the, you know, the 100 years before that and what led to this and what led to that. And, you know, small little deals that, that foreign ministers make with each other sort of in the back room and that are public documents. You know, you can read about them. And, and the role that aviation actually played in these massive um, struggles in the, in the world, I mean, that has also been of interest to you. Aviation has been used as, as a kind of, like, nationalistic device by, by all nationalities. You know, like, look what we can do. And um, which, is, which is why uh, uh, the launch of Sputnik in 1957 was so, so important. For the Soviets, it's not that that Sputnik is pronounced Sputnik. It means friendly companion of the Earth, and um, uh, it was it was more important from from a nationalistic point of view because they could sort of advertise this in the third world, which was their market, right? So one of the things that happened in all of this is that we fought a lot of proxy wars with with the Soviet Union in third world countries, uh, countries like Vietnam and Korea, and um, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, uh, uh, Nicaragua. And they're still going on, right? So I, to answer some of your question, I think that the Cold War is still happening. You know, there's... Here we go. Um, what word did you use just now? Um, I can't remember, but it had something to do with bad business. Um, I'm kind of curious, about, um, what, are you, what, what are your feelings or thoughts about some of the... Um, I know that there's problems with some, some fighter jets that are being built vis-a-vis, -vis, I guess, uh, America. I, I know that they've been spending that ridiculous amount of money on, on fighter jets that are not functioning or working 
I sure do. <laughs> well, I. <laughs> You know, they're, I'm an Eisenhower Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, these these things, you know, there's there's uh, quite often we bite off more than we can chew. That's that's the whole beauty of this is stepping into something you're not quite prepared for and trying to make it work. And that's why I think, like I think of these engineers, right? Like like building the the, the twenty ones. Uh, just north of Moscow in the 1950s and struggling, you know, at, at, you know from, from all accounts at, at the threat of death should they not be able to, to make this happen, right? Um, and then presumably some of them might have died and, and so on, had their families taken from them. And, um, uh, you know, like, and, and, and I always wonder about both the engineer that could solve the design problem as well as the engineer that couldn't. And um, that nowadays, you know, like as, as bad as I think maybe sometimes the world seems, it may not be so, so bad. You know, we have, we have better communication in some respects, which is definitely helpful, you know. Um, and and I, I like to think, you know, sometimes it depends on, on what five minutes you catch me in, you know, but... Um, but yeah, they spend a lot of money here, and you know Eisenhower was was kind of against that, you know, his whole military industrial complex. Okay, what's, what's in the book was fifty-seven percent of of what they break in. Loud, loud. Fifty-seven percent of of what they break in needs to be income tax goes directly to the military industrial complex. At least that's what they say. That's what they publish. <laughs> I believe it. Interestingly, 57 degrees is the wing sweep angle. Of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? You said in uh, all the tooling that you've created to make all these paper products and how, how uh, uh, they compare with like the real tooling, like all the you know, shears and crates and Generally within um, a thousandth of an inch tolerances, so they're um, the. Uh, I'm doing my best, man, uh, and we're trying to do it on a budget well, too. Well, I'm, I'm not talking about like, <laughs> what, like what the tolerances are, but I'm talking about what like how they compare as like. like oh, they're they're they're, they're 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 roughly analogous, right? So we have a system of hog carts. Um, that raise and lower the fuselage, but I did mine with, with uh, I mean, they sound real janky, me describing them this way, but I use car jacks, uh -huh. you know, to raise and lower the fuselage sections, and, um, and so the, they're, they're, they're adjustable, you know, and, and so you have things like that, like hog carts and, and, and things in, in the aircraft factories, which is why the, the picture of the B-58 Hustler that I pointed out to you guys, that you remember, um, is so appealing to me because it's like my, my, my airplane factory. Um, I'm making about five different types of paper um, in-house. I've uh, devised a system, kind of like an easy bake oven, where where we dehydrate the paper and and uh, that's that's has the uh, some of the same qualities of, of ductile aluminum. So some of the paper is, is very strong. To give you an idea of of what it is, I'm trying to balance a 52 foot long paper fuselage that, that weighs about 3,000 pounds. On three small diameter pins, about five inches in diameter, uh, it's 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 got a system of, of cantilevered load bearing structures, and the last twenty six feet of airframe is freestanding. Um, it's got a tricycle undercarriage, so that means that two wheels come out of the wings, and one comes out of the nose, and then the last twenty six feet of the airframe, past midpoint, is is just sort of hovering over ground. It's a cantilevered structure. Things you see on the outside, 
and putting it on its head and making it your own, and kind of putting it back in the face. Is there a element of that? Yeah, um, I, interestingly, right? So, so I think most people's experience with Joseph Stalin is probably a negative one. Um, but interestingly, in, in the Russian Federation currently, he has his highest approval ratings ever. So it's all a matter of perspective, right? He industrialized the country. He brought them into the 20th century. There were a subsistence agrarian economy before that. They have some nationalism and pride tied to the idea of technological innovation. Um, and so the, the classic Western take on the cult of personality, which is this idea that, you know, like, he made them like him, which may have been true in his time, but the revisionist history or whatever that's going on now is, uh, is, is definitely favorable to him. So what I do is I make my own propaganda and, and I draw pictures of Stalin, which is probably horrible. But uh, I like doing it. <sighs> I think he's kind of a bad guy. I mean, but on a horse. <laughs> you know, it's it's weird because I don't even like to offer opinions about stuff like that because I honestly the the real answer is I don't know enough to have an opinion. Um, which is how I feel. I can tell you something interesting about Vladimir Putin. Um, historically, you know, there's a lot of repression over there, right? The way that, that it's portrayed in the West. And um, there are journalists uh, coming out of, I have friends who lived under the old Soviet system and they hated it, you know? Um, uh, Georgians and Armenians, friends of mine. And I, everyone I've talked to that actually lived under the system did not like it. But they're really good at one thing, you know, <laughs> if, if you know anything about the history of all that. Um, uh, those those socialized, you know, work and healthcare and stuff over there, right? Um, Vladimir Putin, from what I understand, has his least favorite journalist assassinated on his birthday every year. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's you're laughing, but this is like a serious thing that they do, and um, murdered in elevators kind of thing, you know, and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's one thing, you know, like we see this very cartoonish aspect of of world leaders because that's how they choose to have themselves prepared, you know. Um, they are, I would imagine, in control of that. And um, Vladimir Putin was, a, I believe, a KGB assassin before he became president 18 times in a row. So, like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's more to it than just, you know, like the, the kind of you know, Western take on it, but there's also more to it than, than even he's saying. You know? yeah. But he looked he looks serious as shit. I remember, excuse me, um, the there was this time where 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 George Bush showed up, George W, and he went to the thing and, and he uh, he brought Vladimir Putin a cowboy hat. I'll never forget this. I saw this on TV, and and as a present, you know, this diplomatic gift. And, and he put it on Putin's head, and Putin didn't smile, and he didn't respond, and he wasn't happy about it. And he took it off, and he put it on George Bush's head. And then George Bush took it off, and he's like, no, 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 friendly gesture from America. And he tried to do it again, and Putin just sort of glared at him, and it was just truly frightening. I think he's a scary guy. <laughs> to answer your question. Yes. One of the figures in the 20th century says something very profound. He says that he doesn't know what, from an average time, you know, he says he doesn't know what weapon we're going to use to fight World War III, but he knows that World War IV will use sticks and stones. Do you kind of believe that? Would you object to the other Would you like me to guess? Um, you know, we don't to prepare ourselves for suicide. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I'd like to believe that that maybe won't happen, you know. But yeah, I mean, I, I, actually, to answer your question, I think we're fighting World War III right now. I agree. I think that, 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 that money, I, I do agree with that. I think money is the new weapon of mass destruction. And I think that, like, I mean, I really don't want this to get too political, even though it's a political talk, uh, at least as far as my opinions go. But I, I will say this. I think that... that that it's easy, right? Uh, this is one thing I'd like to say about my project, about uh, Cold War history, and, and what 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 the party line happens to be at any given moment. You know, like 
A simple question doesn't always have a simple answer. And I think that, like, you know, I'm just one guy, and you know, I know a little bit about this thing or that, but I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not in a position, certainly, where I can affect change in any aspect of the world, I think. You know? I can adopt a cat. <laughs> <laughs> they have good questions. You got a big brain. Um, you know, there's this kind of idea, or this, this kind of these rumors that kind of float around about technology, and um, they, you know, they say uh, they, they um, that what we use now is kind of like 20 years ago. In your kind of process of kind of researching, I guess this. Kind of well, I, I. Are you aware of the velocity of that kind of? I can tell you what I know. And this yeah, is kind of interesting. I built a, a analog computers for about 15 years, and um, it's something I, I I wanted to I I wanted to own vintage analog synthesizers, you know, to make like pop music with. And I, <laughs> I I couldn't afford them; they were very expensive. So I learned to fix them, and I started building function generators. and And as I kind of dove into like 1960s, 1970s high tech, right? Um, I became very familiar with, with the way that technology develops. And I would assert that probably every single conversation is being recorded, you know, uh, since at least about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I think that these are things that I take for granted and that I think of as being facts. The technology has been there for decades. I think that especially since the Freedom of Information Act and uh, this sort of, you know, I, yeah, I mean, based on what I know, yeah, not only is it possible, it's probable, and if it's probable, it po probably is happening, um, because they, they certainly have the, the legal freedom now to do it as well. So, so right, so when all of this started happening in America, uh, we got, uh, we were at some sort of diplomatic event, where I think uh, it might have been Boris Yeltsin, and he said something to one of the diplomats from the new president here, he was like, uh, or whoever it was, he was like, well, now you guys can catch up to what we've been doing since the 50s, <laughs> you know? So uh, they had a, a lot more experience listening in on every single conversation. And so they offered some maybe practical advice or something. Um, just uh, oh, go ahead, and then I'll ask the final question. I have a question. You go through this practice of taking something from the past and the present, whether it's this maybe a living or Chicken pianos. Of, right. Or that you, the, uh, this idea of where you were a child making paper airplanes fun. Why is it important for you to go through this painstaking process of taking something, these memories from the past, this global thing of an airplane, the Soviet era, or you just actively playing paper airplanes? Why is this for you as an artist, as a person, like important? You're okay. There's not just one reason, there's, um, there's a few. Um, one of them is that it gives me something that I feel is worthwhile to do, my time. Um, I like the challenge of it. You know, I, I give myself crazy projects because I'm like, well, this would be, you know, impossible and I'll just do it and I'll really try real hard and, and, and hopefully I can do it. So there's that, it keeps me out of trouble. Um, and, and, and back to the idea of communicating, you know, like the MiG-21 in terms of like airplane numbers is essentially as common as a piece of silverware. It's like a, a fork, you know, uh, for what it is in, in the world in which it exists. And, you know, you look at one and, and you probably wouldn't, if you're not like an airplane person that's interested, you know, it's one of those people that's, that's interested in aviation, probably wouldn't know it from, from a similar configuration, you know. And I, I wanted to clarify a little bit. I wanted to clarify in terms of my project. I wanted to clarify that. Like, I think that, that a lot of things are glossed over um, in, in the way that I communicate, in the way that, I guess, communication happens towards me, and I, I like to clarify. How about the experience of you as a child making airplanes? And how is that important to how the students you Well, I got a giant painting of Stalin's face in my studio. So, like, what I have is, is a Soviet aircraft production hangar. You know, and, and we're doing what, what Nick was asking about, this cult of personality thing. And I get to be an aviation engineer for, for a few years. So I've been working on this for about two years. And I think, actually, what's something that nobody's brought up, surprisingly, 
I think that one of the most interesting things about this is the logistics, right? Figuring out where to get the right size paper tube at the right time of day, right? Like for instance, two inch diameter paper tubes at Joanne Fabrics, Mondays and Wednesdays at about 11.30 a.m. You know, there's, myself and my team have manufactured 250,000 individual products in the last two years. And um, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of duplicates and a lot of duplication, but um, there's a lot of, of, of single run kind of productions as well. And um, I like the idea of, of, of workflow logistics in, in, in my little operation. You know, we have a, a just-in-time business uh, business model where I only bring in materials right before we use them so it obviates the storage issue. And for me, that kind of thinking is, is really attractive. I want to be efficient, you know. Does that answer your question? And you've got to answer something. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess, well, because, because growing up, I wanted to, I not only wanted to draw representation really well, I wanted to draw portraits really well, right? And, um, coming to terms with how very unfashionable that is, you know, taught me a lot about myself. So, finally, now, I can draw portraits reasonably well, I think. And, um, but it, it's not what I thought it was going to be, you know? And so it's an exploration of that. As a child, I would, I would, you know, pine for the ability to draw representation. It was a central fact of my life. I wanted to be so good at it. And it took me 30 years before I could be good at it. And by then, it, it, other things started to matter. And, like... You know, still wanting to honor that memory. And that it's sort of that, you know, this is an idea I had six years ago, and, and I always thought, well, that, you know, from a logistics standpoint, it was very daunting. And I went back to it and I thought, hell, what have I got to lose? You know, it was a good idea then, maybe it's still a good idea. I believed in it, and I wanted to, to honor the memory of that as much as anything. And the hardest thing I'll tell you about building an airplane is deciding to. Right? You know, the, the rest of it is you cut this, you cut that, you glue it together, and you have an airplane. But the, uh, the, uh, no, seriously. What's what the first component? <coughs> what, what first component? Where did you start? The center body, the air, and the, the, the what my sister calls the beak of the aircraft. <laughs> um, I just want to ask one last sort of question, and then we can kind of mill around and we'll get your questions. Uh, uh, but uh, but the kind of big question in the room is what, what do you plan to, to do with it when it when it's finished and, and when might you estimate that it'll be done? Well, you know that's the funny thing about this project, Amanda. <laughs> um, I think it'll be done in about five months. We're at, we're at a seventy-two percent. Uh, we're at about seventy-two percent completion, um, and now like I'm I'm. There's so many thousands of individual little parts that have been made, but now they have to be fitted and, and, and placed. And, and, uh, There's no rush. <laughs> right. Um, gosh, there, you know what? I'll tell you something. I'll be just very honest with you where I'd like to see it. I want to see it in the lobby of the United Nations. That's where I'd like to see it. Um, sometimes, you know, like, like you think about what what you are, you know. Growing up, I would, I would, I, I wound up working as a, a casting metal all through the nineties and making bronze castings in silver and silica and, and um, uh, green sand and uh, ceramic and plaster and everything else. And like being really interested in like you know the George Washington statue in the park, this very permanent sort of marker, 
uh, monumental thing. I think I would love to see it also disintegrate on the airfield of Tushino where it goes to, you know, like just obviates a storage issue. Which, if anyone's an artist here, you know, storage issues suck. Um, but yeah, like you know, I I I I wanted to make something really impermanent, and and you know, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, All right, Sinisa, so that's the last one. Okay. I'm just thinking about this. I want to share this with you, without everybody else here. It's just this idea, this notion, of you know, childhood Tucson coming up. Mm-hmm. Just, you think about it this way. The way I like to think about it. Right? I'll do whatever you tell me. How many times do. have we all said, someone, was, we all said this in our lives at one point, it was like, imagine if I can be like, you know, 18 again with everything that I know now. I mean, I think this is one of the wonderful things about any, any artist that's willing to kind of face their, their kind of upbringing and their dreams. And it's... I'd like to also say hard. something else, Nissa. I'm sorry, I mean, I know we're That's okay, we're, that's all right. This is, this is an expression of my insecurity, too. You know, like, I could have just ordered pizza. Said, you know, <laughs> I never felt like I was good at drawing, and I never felt like I was good at art. And you know, maybe there's a little bit of overcompensating here too. So, you know, like there, I, I want to say that you know, like there isn't so methodical. You know, like, but yeah, I, I, I do think a lot about what was important to me, and if that's a good idea, and it's, it's worth revisiting. Thank you so much. You're welcome.